Greetings, friends and family, everybody. I, I, you know, I've met some of you outside, but for those who didn't, my name is Eric Jackson with Sportico, and welcome to the future of the future, investing in the future of sports content panel. And uh, we got a great discussion here. And you know, I've done a good amount of these, but never with two Johns. So you know, <laughs> you guys got to you know bear with us a little bit. You know, <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, we have so much to like, get into, like so much. You know, so kind of first off, obviously. Obviously, you know, just coming off this NFL season, how many of you guys saw the Manning cast? If you didn't, show of hands, probably living under a rock if you didn't see it. Um, you know, the Goofy Brothers, as we all know, and there's some great guests, Marshawn Lynch and others. Um, obviously, it was a big hit. And I'm curious, these gentlemen here, um, you know, what, what did the success of that alternate um, feed kind of tell you guys about the future of sports consumption? I'm not sure it tells us much about the future of sports consumption. I thought it was good. It was entertaining. It brought home to me once again the surprise that we continue to use the broadcast booth to tell people about something they can see on the television. Uh, it's still the radio broadcast. Mm -hmm. You know, Peyton Manning turns, he hands the ball off, goes for three yards at second and seven. I thought the Mannings proved that you didn't have to do that, that you could just have a fun conversation. We tried to do this with Tony Kornheiser back seven, eight, or nine years ago, and the resistance level to interfering with the sanctity of the football game was very high. I will point out an interesting thing, which is uh, I thought the uh, Manning was a nice alternative, frankly, and I tended to watch that, though uh, that network did just spend $350 million to create a great new booth that will compete with the Mannings. So I'm not sure I'm the appropriate person to ask about <laughs> exactly, is this the future of sports? I would think if it's the future of sports, you wouldn't have had to spend $350 million to get Joe Buck and uh, Troy Aikman. So I don't think it means anything to the future. I think for the most part, it's gonna look uh, uh, what they're doing as a sideline and uh, a multicast and doesn't have much to do with the mainstream of how games are produced and presented to the public. Yeah, no, I think, look, in terms of as a consumer, I thought it was great because, I mean, per John's point, um, John with an H, um, was <laughs> that, you know, the, the way that games are presented, you know, the live game, it's almost stunning how little it has changed aside from the technical innovations of the you know the cameras and instant replay but it's the studio show pregame the booth the postgame studio show with the same highlights that are commodified online or on social within like minutes so i liked it uh, just in terms of you know how hey oh my god there's another perspective like we can watch the way we actually watch at home um, and it's not new. They, they tried this as far back as, I don't know, the Olympics in 92 with like the triple cast, right. you know, with NBC. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, who's going to have the, you know, we're in Texas, cojones to actually like break the mold mm -hmm. and have a more personalized feed, whatever the sport is. And look, the Mannings are great. Is a Texas cojone different than an ordinary one? <laughs> no, that's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> It was interesting. It was an interesting turn of phrase. I, I did have an experience that I, so I was at DAZN for a couple of years, and we had a streaming service, so we had games. And we pretty quickly discovered the reason to have all that surround programming is to have more time to run advertising in, right? Mm -hmm. We did discover that once you have a streaming service, that the only thing people turn into is the game. So all the surround programming will become less relevant and less important as sports does move to streaming, then it is overwhelmingly just the game. That speaks to the future of the ecosystem, right? Yes. Yeah. And overall, you know, I was having this discussion with somebody else, and they were like, you know, Eric, uh, the same topic, and they are like, Eric, you know, athletes are the creators now. And I do want to ask you guys, how much value do you see on athletes sort of blending that traditional and the traditional and digital media, you know, create some pretty compelling original content? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you this. I mean, you know, it's something we've talked about. It's something we talk about a lot. Obviously, it's a huge empowerment for athletes writ large, right. right? Does it mean that every athlete should be a creator or there's an audience for every athlete? I would say no. And I don't say that as someone, oh my God, I'm a gatekeeper. I need to only, I only producers can do this. No, it's just that, you know, ultimately it's a market, right? And so we have a universe where, you know, Netflix or Apple or Amazon 
pay for things, or they, they express their interest in paying for it. And the reality is, in sports, I don't know, maybe there's 10 athletes really in the world for whom there's a real value to their story. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not a place for athletes to, to build or things. I just think there's a, there needs to be honest conversations between representatives, you know, on the agency side or producers from our side to say, look, your lane might be best served doing the branded spots or doing a podcast. You're, it's not a 10 episode doc series, you know, and, and the problem is a lot of athletes at a lot of levels think they can do that and build their brand. They don't all need a production company. Is that a personality thing or is that? I think it's just a FOMO thing. You know, it's like, hey, there's all these content is king and there's such a huge, and every athlete feels they need to have a production company or if you're, you've made an all-star team, you're therefore deserving of an all access doc series. Well, no, I mean, that's just the truth. Yeah, yeah I, I'll, uh, I'll give first one piece of disclosure. So uh, we met with Eric, and Eric said, you know, I want you guys to mix it up a little bit and do this or that. John and I uh, are going in business together, uh, so we should disclose that. We were making a couple of documentary films together. So I said, we can still disagree, because John has strong opinions, and I do. But I'm not going to light him up. You know, we're busy, uh, we're busy uh, working on a couple of things and having a great time. I'd make a couple of points. One is the athlete empowerment thing is spectacular. Uh, you could argue that for many years, uh, one of the great wealth transfers in this country from the people in power to people who weren't in power was in the salaries that are paid to athletes. And um, um, what's happening now is athletes are using that economic power and that social power to create their own businesses. Some of those businesses are production companies, and that's a good thing, and I'll talk about that in just one second. But look at what happened yesterday, and there's a through line from LeBron James doing something revolutionary for which he got great criticism, but he turned out to be the guy who was, you know, the lead rider in a Peloton uh, breaks the, the resistance of the wind for the people behind them. LeBron James did that by deciding to go on ESPN and announce his decision to go play for the Miami Heat. South Beach. Right, a lot of criticism. Mm -hmm. Any criticism yesterday of Tom Brady for tweeting out uh, what he, that he's not retired anymore, he's gonna play? None, because the world has changed. Athletes have the ability to, to express themselves through social media. Some people want to express themselves by making documentaries about themselves. That's probably one step too far. <laughs> um, to me, the best athletes, athletes have great stories. Sports cr always creates great drama. It's the most natural. You can sit in a room and try to think up new scripted dramas and comedies. Sports makes its own stories. Mm -hmm. And athletes now say, I want to tell my own story. I don't want to turn it over to, to John Weinbach, John Skipper, ESPN, Fox, Fox to tell that story. I want to tell it. The best representation of that is when you can put great athletes together with great writers and great journalists, great producers and great directors. Uh, that's where you really get great content. We uh, have created a new model at ESPN called an imprint because we think athletes want to be empowered. He means Meadowlark. They created it at Meadowlark <laughs> at ESPN. It's a 27 year old habit. Uh, uh, and I love him. Um, uh, but at Meadowlark, we've created a new strategy where I spoke to a number of athletes and I'm like, what do you want to accomplish by being in a production business? And they said two things. I want creative freedom. I want to be able to tell my own story and I want ownership. That's another beautiful part of athlete empowerment is they want now to own things. So we created an imprint strategy. We just announced with Andre Guadala and Evan Turner and launched a podcast this week called Point Forward. So we're 50-50 partners. So they have ownership, they have creative freedom. We're providing the back-end services so they don't have to figure out, they don't have to do that. They don't have to spend the capital to do that. We're doing that. So I think there's a good place to meet in the middle where athletes can tell their stories. But to John's point, see, I told you we weren't gonna fight. <laughs> uh, to John's point, uh, often doing it by themselves, uh, they know about as much about that as I know about playing basketball. I thought I was a great basketball player. You notice all men think they're better than they are at some sport. I thought I was better than I was at basketball. The, so I, Look, I, I would say that having been a reporter, mm -hmm. um, I think the anxiety over athletes as creators is primarily from the world of print 
print journalism. What's because, that? You know, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and print or, you know, just entrenched, let's call it legacy mm -hmm. media. Because, you know, if you were a reporter, you really had unbelievable power. Mm -hmm. You know, you, that was the only way for athletes to communicate. Mm -hmm. And so when you lose that and the companies that had that lost that, that's a real bummer. You know, and so that was a, a real shift. And so, don't make a mistake. I I think in so many ways it's an incredible thing. Mm -hmm. I just think when you're talking about the creation of premium content, um, that's where I, I think it's it's in the same vein. I, I just don't think everybody's equipped to do that or or needs to for success. I kind of want to get into like the red meat of viewership, right? And obviously, the audience is so fragmented now, and you know, there's so many viable media options. You know, you name it, right across the board. From being in you know the position of both you two, it's you know, what opportunities or challenges do you see in trying to expand your audience and you know I, I guess appeal to that younger demographic too, right? It's like the ongoing challenge. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I think for us, I mean, look, I we just launched this uh, sports studio at Skydance Media, and so you know Skydance does big film and television, little franchises like you know Mission Impossible and Top Gun, and you know <laughs> these the, little these little ones, you know, and the Adam Project, and you know, when they launched an animation division, you know, we hired John Lasseter, the modern founder of you know modern Walt Disney. So I, I feel in pretty good company. When they wanted animation, <laughs> they hired John Lasseter. When they wanted sports, they hired me. So, um, but you know, it's it's a it's a balance of premium. You know what can what can you know create in the marketplace in terms of value, and also premium in terms of taste, you know, and prestige. And rather than searching for like we're not we're not in the podcast game currently, we're not in social media. So you have to in, in our thing, it's premium scripted, unscripted, you know, films and, and docs. And so you know, for me personally. Part of it is, is, look, I'm a basketball fanatic, I'm a soccer fanatic, I'm a one percenter sports geekery across the board. So, but I look at those two sports in particular as having the biggest global footprint and that's all we hear about, you know, across the board is, hey, it's gotta be global. And so those are the, you know, if you ask to ask me, hey, what's my focus? I would say all of it, but in particular being, you know, in basketball and in soccer. The bread and butter. Yeah, I mean, and I'll, look, to say nothing, love baseball, love football, <laughs> hockey, Olympic sports, all of it. But I just think when you look at, A, the athletes who can generate the most mm -hmm. interest and the stories that generate the most interest, and we have these conversations with buyers like, you know, hey, is it going to appeal to South America? Those are the two in my mind. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm confused because I got my mind bamboozled by the red meat of viewership and I'm being in Texas. I thought we were trying to get steers to watch television. Um, uh, it didn't work. Did it? I was thinking about whether it would work or not, but it clearly didn't. Um, Increased viewership. People watch more media than they've ever watched. You just uh, where they watch it and how they watch it, mm -hmm. uh, what they want to watch is changing, and you just got to get in front of that. Mm -hmm. Right? You got to figure out uh, what people want. You can you can quickly prove that you can make a mistake, assuming that people only want short things. Mm -hmm. I don't think people only want short things. I think people want things that move them, uh, make them feel inspired, give them a feeling of their own self-worth and identity. That's a lot of what social media tools do, right? Mm -hmm. Provide you with the opportunity to present yourself to the public. Um, so I, I'm not really worried about finding people, to John's point, I'm not worried about finding people for high-quality content. There's always viewers for high-quality content bovine or otherwise <laughs> and you guys have a, Still a, work. a lot of mutual connections overall but um you know metal Arc has a deal with apple last year uh -huh. you guys recently extended your partnership you know um with apple as well what um you know partnering with arguably the most valuable company in the world you know how does that help elevate what you you two are you know doing at you know at your shops as I like to say. Well, the question may have your, your question may have answered itself <laughs> uh, when you said they were the uh, most valuable company in the world, right? We both yeah. have a, ultimately have deals with Apple because Apple uh, has a lot of capital mm -hmm. and they're a good patron to have because they will buy things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, and there is prestige value, right? Particularly mm -hmm. starting a company, and John has started the sports division of Skydance. I've started Metal Arc. I'm now getting let clear my mind um, uh, and you want to be associated with very high quality brands and that's Apple so it's the capital the, the prestige value of the of the brand association yeah that's right I mean in our in our case uh, it's on this for Skydance it's on the scripted film side mm -hmm. so there's 
you know, basically a first look uh, and also a commitment from Apple to do two films per year from Skydance, you know. But, hey, I just got there. I hope I hope that, you know, we'll get one of those it slots. Moves, it moves you know? over, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't pretend to say to step in here and say, hey, you're one, we're getting one of those, mm -hmm. and we're going to do an Apple, we'd love to. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, my focus is on obviously premium scripted and unscripted, uh, scripted and also kind of more on the series side. Mm -hmm. But, hey, it, it so happens the first project that we've got going is probably going to be a feature. But, mm -hmm. um, yes, I mean, for all those reasons, it's Apple. Right. You know, I mean, it's... Uh, in some ways, some cases, uh, you know, having first look at overall deals in, 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 with certain entities in the past, I think, you know, you could make an argument pro or con. Right. But, you know, at, in this moment that we live in, to be associated with Apple, I think, is a quite powerful thing. And obviously, Apple just got with Friday Night Baseball, and you know, which is a really interesting deal. And I'm just curious your thoughts on kind of leveraging, you know, live sports programming and the content itself, like kind of reaching the, the, the widest audience possible. Like, is that the end goal, you think, John, at least? Uh, well, okay. their end goal is to drive subscribers, and sports is the most passionate form of entertainment, so mm -hmm. subscribers will be driven. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, this is happening quicker around the rest of the world than in the United States, because mm -hmm. in the United States, there's still $110, $115 billion in the pay TV universe, mm -hmm. So, and sports is the best way to get that money. So sports is going to stay right. on broadcast and pay television longer here than other places. Mm -hmm. But in Italy... Uh, when DAZN bought uh, all 10 Serie A games, uh, multiple millions of subscribers moved from pay television to streaming. Mm -hmm. So that is going to happen. And the Apple buying those Friday night baseball games, mm -hmm. um, uh, Amazon buying the Thursday night football right. means it's beginning to happen here. And it should put, uh, it should cause uh, great trepidation in the stomachs of uh, pay TV and broadcast network executives mm -hmm. because they have more money mm -hmm. and to buy sports rights you need money uh, and lots of it mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. they're coming and because it'll move people over and you have to have them to drive subscribers uh last panel i was on uh somebody put up a, a picture of me with a quote from 2012 uh when i was at espn and i was quoted as saying no i'm not worried uh, about Apple and Amazon and everybody <laughs> buying sports rights. By the way, it was fair because during my tenure, they did not. So when I left, I guess they uh, felt that they could come in. Right. Um, and, uh, but uh, that I said I was right at the time. I'm wrong now. Mm. They're, they're coming. Uh, and it should, it should worry people. It should also, it's going to create confusion and difficulty for consumers. It's not mm. going to be easier. Well, uh, another thing I used to like to say a lot was people are going to wish that they had the pay TV subscription back uh, because you could pay and you might have felt like you were paying more than you wanted to, but you could pay one person and you got everything you could ever watch in sports. You got the regional networks, mm -hmm. every SEC game, every set of Wimbledon tennis. Now it's going to be scattered across a half a dozen, eight, nine, 10, 12 broadcast networks. Uh, cable networks and six different streaming services. Try to figure out where you're going to watch uh, uh, where you're going to watch all of European soccer, right? You're going to have to have ESPN Plus. You're going to have to have Paramount Plus. You're going to have to have a Fox, HBO Max. Yeah, yeah HBO yeah. Max. You, yeah. you know, it's it's not going to be easier. It's going to be harder, and it's going to cost more money. Uh, uh, than it what did cost you to get a pay television. That sounds like a take, though, right there, John. So the sports court cutters are going to regret their decision. I, I think they we might have do. to put up another quote. They, uh, I think they already what? do. I mean, I, 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 I don't know that they regret cutting the court. <laughs> yeah. There's our moment of discord. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, um, it just, it, I find it, it's really annoying right now to watch, to know. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's harder. It's, you know, There's you know. the old canard. Be careful what you wish for. Mm. You now have it. You don't have to buy a pay TV subscription anymore, but you're going to have to buy 15 subscription services. And, yeah, they're all cheaper now than they're going to be in two years. And when you have to have them, they're going to cost $19.95 and $29.95. <laughs> and suddenly you're going to be paying $300 for what you used to pay $98 for. That's how capitalism works. I kind of want to go into, like, a little bit of long form. I, you guys have a lot of, you know, knowledge across the industry, but as far as uh, I think the biggest overlap is just – long story, or I should say, uh, long form storytelling in the documentary space. And obviously in this, in this time, right, well, you know, people want their information fast and quick. I'm just curious your thoughts on, you know, where the future of sports documentary filmmaking is going to go and, um, you know, how do you kind of combat this, you know, where attention spans might not be as, uh, as long as they, they were at one point. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I have my attention was <laughs> and I, I can't remember your question. My point exactly. No, point sorry. exactly. John, you want to start? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, well, I'll take the last part. I think the whole attention span, we must need snackable content. Right. Like, it feels like it was written in, like, marketing ease by, <laughs> by someone who actually doesn't consume content. Because, like, I have a 13-year-old and a 14-year-old, mm -hmm. uh, two boys. They have crazy attention spans. They mm -hmm. watch you know, Ninja on YouTube or, you know, they'll watch 20, 27 minute videos where I am like, it's enough. You know, it, it, I'm the one who's actually losing my, my attention span. I think that part of it is the world's moving so fast that, that there is this, you know, uh, I don't know about romanticism, but I, I think there's just an interest in telling stories. Uh, like taking a pause kind yeah, of. Yeah, taking a pause stories. And also, look, there's part of it is thanks to, Candidly, John and the team at ESPN for building the 30 for 30 series, for greenlighting the OJ, you know, series mm -hmm. that won an Academy Award at six episodes, like, or five episodes. Well, when it was made, it was, it was two episodes. It was seven hours and 43 minutes, and there was an intermission Correct. between the first and the second. They have since, I think, cut it into multiple episodes, five. Mm. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> well, the, I mean, look, the reality is, this didn't exist. Like there was not a commercial model for, you know, basically I used to joke doing docs was like a prescription for poverty, uh, right? I mean, that was a, there was not money in it. There was a couple of people, Michael Moore, maybe, you right. know, the, the, who were the very tippy top of the game. There was one network doing sports documentaries. It was HBO. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can say it here candidly, even the, the, the first, I don't know, 60, 30 for 30s did not pay very well, you know, so, uh, but, but at least it gave it a, a market. But then this whole notion of the multi, the long series and the OJ success. And I can tell you, you know, having been part of the, the Last Dance team since before it was a deck, I think we envisioned it at six episodes and then it became 10. Now, Michael Jordan and the, the Bulls deserved that. I don't know that every story, story deserves yeah. eight The appetite episodes. was there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you had a great amount of unseen footage mm -hmm. that made it feel new and different. Uh, I don't worry about attention spans. It's a boom time for documentaries, right? I mean, there's more documentary footage. Uh, I mean, more documentaries on uh, streaming services than ever before. They, it also works for their business model, right? right. I mean, uh, they want eight episodes. They want 10 episodes because you have two issues with subscription streaming service, right? You've got to get subscribers, and it yeah, costs a lot them. of money, mm -hmm. and two, you've got to retain them. But well, if you can get them to watch 10 weeks of The Last Dance, mm -hmm. they're not going to cancel their subscription. Right. I mean, the great part of the subscription business model uh, is that you have data and, uh, and money directly from consumers, you get their credit card, you can figure out more things about them. The bad part of it is you can cancel it right now, right? You don't right. like it anymore. We, again, we saw this at Design. they saw it. Traditionally, I, I was in the magazine publishing business for many years, 50% of all people let their subscription run out. That's about the same thing that happened at HBO for years. They would have to assume they were gonna play somewhere between a third and a half of their subscribers. Mm -hmm. So they won't long form. So business models sometimes will be in conflict with short attention spans, <laughs> Yeah. but business model often wins. Uh, Isaiah Thomas on a, a podcast we did said something funny. He said, big money always, be, it always tells little money what to do. Right. And the biggest money right now wants long stuff. I also think that's not going anywhere. I mean, I, I mean, look, there might be trends in terms of what stories, what sports people are into. Right. But I think it's not, I mean, Netflix, the streaming services, candidly, they created this big market mm -hmm. and they saw that unscripted, you know, sort of premium unscripted could work. It didn't just have to be Pawn Stars or super formatted, right. so, you know. Pawn stars. Uh, I thought you said something else. There. Yeah, something else. Or super formatted, <laughs> quote, reality shows that, that were like the bread and butter of all the cable networks, right? And, you know, I, I think that as the world gets more global, mm -hmm. you know, look, would anybody have predicted Squid Game? Would anybody right. have predicted Money Heist? Like, these are shows that are, you know, orthodox, unorthodox, like Fauda, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I think that that's going to happen in sports as well. I, I would say one place where, and it, it, uh, we're a sports summit, so it matters a lot, where the, the greatest fear you should have about people watching long form is people do not watch games anymore. Almost nobody watches a full game. When's the last time anybody, I, I'm sure people do here, 
Uh, so I won't ask. So, yeah. Uh, just in case you all contradict me, I don't, there's no reason to be publicly humiliated. No, I'm, I, but, <laughs> but, but people don't watch games. They're 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 highly satisfied to watch. A, mm-hmm. I, I watch. Uh, I'm an English Premier League fan. I'm a Tottenham fan. Mm-hmm. I don't watch 90 minutes of football anymore. I watch the 12, 13, 14 minute cut down highlight version of the game that appears right. on uh, NBC's uh, uh, website because that's all I need. I see every goal, I see every interesting pass. It's even worse in some American sports, at least in soccer, they're playing the whole time. But does that speak to the attention span? Like show of hands, how many, what was the-